Uh, my name is Marconi, and I'm going to, to talk about what is new in Scala, what's new since programming in Scala. So you may know the Programming Scala book by Martin Odarsky and Lex Poon and Bill Venners. Uh, it is the definitive guide uh, to Scala. I believe it's the book that most of us have used to, 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 to learn Scala. Uh, the problem is that the book is quite old, actually. The latest edition was released in December 2010, over four years ago, four years and a half ago, and it only covers up to Scala 2.8. Uh, so I, I talk to Bill Verners every time I meet him at the conference. Uh, he always jokes with me that they are working on the book, on the new edition, they just don't, don't have enough time to finish so, and a lot of things happened in Scala since then. You know, we had 2.9, uh, 2.10 was a pretty big release, and 2.11. So, let's have a look at what have changed. So, just a quick overview of the Scala timeline. Um, uh, Scala was created in 2003, so they, the first public release were uh, released in 2003, 08, 08 and 09. 2004, we had a 1.0, and uh, then 2005, 1.4, and 2006, uh, Scala 2.0 was released, and this was a very important release because the Scala compiler, for the first time, was written in Scala itself, so it was self-hosting compiler. As we know, this is a very important milestone for a programming language. Uh, 2007, a couple of new release, um, and Lyft, the web framework, was released in 2007, so um, to the best of my knowledge, it's one of the oldest widespread uh, big Scala projects in the widest, the Lyft framework. Uh, 2008, we have 27, and then in 2010, you know, for the first time, 2009 didn't have a Scala release. So 2010, we had Scala 2.8, which is a pretty big release. Uh, one of the biggest, it was almost called Scala 3, and the only reason they didn't call it Scala 3 is just because the name 2.8 was already out there and people were referring to the release as 2.8, so that was the only reason it was not called Scala 3. This was a very important release. Uh, Play 1.1, 1 .1, uh, the, the web framework, so it got f support for Scala uh, through a plugin. Uh, Play was written in Java back then, but they had a plugin that you could use to write uh, Play applications with Scala. And Akka was released also in 2010. Uh, 2011, we had 2.9, uh, and TypeSafe, the company, was created. And 2012, uh, Play 2 was released, uh, and this time it was written in Scala, so the equation reversed. Uh, Java was the second class citizen the play framework was native Scala. 2013, we had Scala 2.10, which was a very big release too, uh, I believe as big as, if not bigger, as 2.8. Um, last year, Scala 2.11 was released. And next year, uh, there are plans to release Scala 2.12, which is gonna bring a lot of fundamental change uh, to the, not so much to the language itself, but to the compiler uh, infrastructure. Okay, so a quick overview of what was new in Scala 2.8 since it was a very big, important release. And it had a huge number of bug fixes and an impressive amount of new features. Uh, redesign uh, collection library, the can build from, you know, the infamous can build from, was introduced. Uh, named and default parameters, a very important feature. So now case class could have a copy method. Uh, package objects, nested annotations, type specialization for box primitives, and Java converters. You know, we have in, in Scala Java conversions, which uh, is automatic implicit conversions, and Java converters is explicit implicit conversions. So you have actually to call uh, as Scala or as Java. It doesn't happen automatically, so you have more control uh, when you're converting the collections. And a revamped REPL, you know, better tab completion and searchable history. And Scala Doc 2 was introduced with a new look and feel, and you could write your Scala Doc using a weak like syntax, much simpler than using HTML as in Java Doc. 
And for the first time in Scala history, they have guaranteed binary compatibility for minor revisions. So 281 would be compatible with 280, 282, 283, but not 29. It's something. It's not ideal, but it's something. Okay. So what is new now in Scala 29, 210, and 211? So as I said, 210 was a pretty big release. If something's not broken, 210 is going to fix it. Uh, first thing is uh, the late in it, in it and the app trade. So we see uh, in the Scala book and in many old tutorials, we see something like object hello extends application, and then you can just call print line hello world. There is no need to, to, to write you know, the, the public static void main string args uh, that you have in Java. The problem is that this is not thread safe and it's not op optimized for the JVM, by the JVM the way it, it was implemented because this actually is, is the constructor. You know, the body of this object is the constructor. Uh, so th it did bring a few problems. So now we have the app trait. Uh, doesn't change anything instead of writing extends application, just write extends app. Uh, one thing that it adds is that the command line arguments are now accessible via the args. Okay, so let's see you know, if it really does matter. Uh, I have here just a simple application that will sum all the numbers from one to four million. Uh, so this is you extending the old application. Uh, and here I didn't change anything. I just, I'm just extending app instead of extending application. So let's see how fast they run. So when I'm using application, it takes about seven seconds to, to sum the four million numbers. When I use app, it takes seven milliseconds. So three orders of magnitude, a thousand times faster. And I said, wow, there's, there must be something wrong here. You know, maybe the JVM is, is doing something funny with the for loops or optimizing some things away. So I decided to rewrite using a while loop now. Okay, let's see if it makes a difference with a while loop. Same thing, I just replaced the for loop with a while loop. And so this is the result I had for the for loop. And when I use the while, you can see that it drops a lot um, from seven seconds to 45 milliseconds. That's good. And we know why that is, because the for loop is not actually a for loop. You know, you're disfiguring that. And actually, you, you are creating a, a lambda there, and you are calling that lambda, so this has a huge overhead. And as we can see, for, for the app trait, didn't change the times, but for the application, it did change. Which brings us to, to the next improvement in Scala 210 that range for each optimization. So, makes code like 0 to 100 for each, as fast as, often faster than a while loop. So when you, you, you use a for, i, 1, 2, n, you used to, to pay a performance penalty there, that's gone. So there is no, no you, you do not lose anything by using a for loop instead of a while loop now. So this is a really, really good improvement. Parallel collections. Uh, it's an effort to facilitate parallel programming by sparing users from low-level parallelization details uh, while providing them with a familiar and simple high-level abstraction. So this is really, really cool feature, Scala 2.9, uh, because it's efficient and it's transparent. Uh, the only thing you need to do, if you have a collection, you call the dot par method, and you keep using the collection as if it were a sequential collection. And if you have a parallel collection and you want to have back, back uh, sequential collection, just call dot sec. Uh, that's it. That's all there is to use uh, the parallel collection. Okay, so just call the method. Uh, depending on the collection, par may be a constant time operation. Okay, uh, for some collections there will be a copy. Uh, sec is always constant, so when you have a parallel collection and want to convert it back to sequential, you, you do not pay any price for that. And the collections that are supported are array, iterable, map, range, sec, set, uh, for 210, uh, tree, and vector. Okay. And one thing to keep in mind, though, is that the parallel collections, they are concurrent and they have out-of-order semantics. 
What that means that the order in which the functions are applied it's arbitrary. I mean, it makes sense. It's parallel. It's not sequential. Okay. And side effects are, are prone to race condition. Of course, we are Scala developers. We do not use side effects, so we do not need to worry about it. Okay, right? Um, and side effects and non-associative uh, operations can lead to non-determinism. So what is meant by there? Uh, okay, yeah. non-commutative operations, however, are deterministic. So what do I mean here? Uh, just a quick uh, recall, uh, something that is associative and commutative is an operation like addition. Doesn't matter if I do one plus two plus three, or if I do one plus two plus three, or if I do two plus one plus three, it doesn't matter. The result is always the same. So something like addition works with parallel collection. Something that is associative but is not commutative is string concatenation. Uh, I can do A plus B plus C. It's the same result as doing A plus B plus C. But it's not the same as doing B plus A plus C. So even though this one is non-commutative, it still works with parallel collections because it is associative. Now, something that is not associative, it's sub subtraction. So 1 minus 2 minus 3 is not the same as 1 minus 2 minus 3. And of course, it's not the same as 2 minus 1 minus 3. So this doesn't work. No, it just so happened that subtraction is also non-commutative, but it doesn't matter. Because it is not associative, you cannot do subtraction in parallel uh, on your collections. So let's see a quick example here. Uh, what I'm doing here, uh, I have a vector. I'm going to fill this vector with uh, 50 million random numbers. And then uh, just to make things, you know, to give some, some work to, for the JVM, I will see if the square of those random numbers meet a target. Okay, I want to see how many of, of that, those numbers meet a target. And now I have my parallel version. Uh, can you spot the difference? Let's go back and forth, back and forth. So there's just that dot par when I'm filling my, my vector. It's all there is to, to the only change I made. So here are the results. Uh, when I run my sequential collection, it takes about 400 milliseconds. And when I run the parallel collection, it takes about 100 milliseconds, which makes sense because this machine is a quad-core processor. So it is using the four cores, and we have a four uh, times the speed up here by just adding dot par. So this is pretty awesome. I, I don't think it can get any easier than that. Okay, now uh, generalize try catch finally block. So it's reusable exception handling. So we have something like try and a, a body, and then we have a catch and a handler for, 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 for a group of exceptions, and finally some cleanup code. Uh, so what does mean is that body and cleanup can be n expressions, and handler is a partial function. So what it means is that now I can define a, a handler for exceptions. So I have here my default handler. It's a partial function from throwable to unit. And then I can put anything I want there. And I have this wall now. And I can use this wall with my catch. I can reuse it. I do not need to write that block over and over again in my code. I can define it only once and reusing that exception catcher. So here I have an example. I try to divide 1 by 0. And I use the default handler. I do not have to write the catch block there. I try to convert uh, a to, to int, uh, string to int. And again, I can reuse that, that same block that I defined up there. Okay? So this is pretty awesome. You know, It's a pretty awesome feature. You can reuse some code where usually you cannot do it in Java. But unfortunately, it's pretty useless <laughs> okay? because there are no exceptions. You, know? you, you, you should not be using exceptions in your code. Exceptions are not functional. Uh, a function that throws an exception is not a total function. It, it, it does not return a value for all possible inputs. So a function that throws an exception is not defined for all their possible input. And as functional programmers, we know that this is, is you know, at the core of functional programming is to have total functions that are defined for all the inputs. 
so do not try to catch exceptions. Try to catch exceptions, okay? Uh, so what is Try? Try was introduced in 2010. It came from, from Twitter. Uh, try represents a computation that may result in an exception or return successfully. Okay. So Try does for exceptions what option does for now. So I, I bet everyone here knows how to use options and they use options everywhere. No one here is using now anymore in their Scala code. And, by the same reason, you know, you, you should not be using no, you should also not be using exceptions, you should use try instead. Uh, you can perform operations without the need to do explicit uh, exception handling in other places where an exception might occur. And just like option, you have some and none. With a try, you have a success and a failure. And only non-fatal exceptions are caught, you know, system errors are still thrown. So this is actually um, essential for, for the proper working of Scala. Some exceptions, they should not be, they should be true. And try takes care of that, of, that for you. Uh, also, try supports uh, operations like map, flat map, recover, recover with, which are just map, like map and f flat map, but for failure instead of success. Filter, get else to option. Um, so they can be used in four comprehensions. You know, they behave like monads. When I was presenting this talk a few months ago in Portland, someone I, I said that try were monads, and someone has raised the hand and said, no, they are not monads because they are not associative. <laughs> okay, so they are try is not a monad, but it does behave like a monad and can be used in four comprehension. They have the same monad interface. Okay, uh, so here's an example uh, of how you can use them. I have a method that instead of returning an int, it's going to re return a try int. It takes two strings, try to convert these strings to, to integers, and then returns the, the one, one number divided by the, the second one. And if I try to, to, to divide zero, uh, A by zero, I'm going to get a number format exception for input string A. If I try to divide one by B, I get something similar, and if I try to divide one by zero, I get uh, arithmetic exception division by zero. So you can see that it, it's nice because you still get back the exact error message that you that happened. You can still pinpoint what the problem was, but you have a much better and simplified interface. You do not need to surround everything with try catch finally blocks. Okay. Uh, so a few examples of the higher order functions that you can use. You can convert a try to an option. That's pretty awesome and pretty useful. Uh, you can use get or else. So you don't care about the exception. You know, if an exception occurs, just going to return a default value. You can do that. And here is a method that I really like, um, get. So usually when we think about option get, oh no, option get is forbidden because option get can throw a new point exception. But try.get is actually pretty useful. Uh, let's say you have some code base, and you know it's a node code base. The method signatures are already returning ints and strings and whatever. And you cannot, at that very moment, change your, your method signatures to return a try. You cannot do that refactoring. It's too big a refactoring. But what do you do? You write your code using try all the way. And at the end, instead of returning that, that try, you return try.get. So if an exception happens, you're going to throw an exception, as you would. But your code now is using try. So when it gets to the point where you can change the method signature to return a try, you just go to the last line and delete the dot .get. And your method is ready for, for the new architecture, so for the new interface. So this is really useful. It's a stopgap solution, so you can make a smooth transition from exceptions to try. Use try.get. Okay, value class, implicit class, and extension methods. All of those were introduced in 210. Implicit classes is just a convenient syntax for defining extension methods. Uh, implicit class have a primary constructor with exactly one parameter. So this is an example. I have an implicit class A that takes an integer, and I can define methods. 
uh, this will be distributed uh, into a class and an implicit method pairing. So it's just like the way we used to do implicit conversions before. I still have my class A and an implicit m m uh, method to do the, the implicit conversion. So it's, it's just syntax sugar to, to simplify the creation of, of implicit conversions. Uh, and because I define a method with the same name as, as the class, I cannot have case class, an implicit case class, because we know the case class will define a companion object with the same name. So there will be a conflict there. You cannot have both. Uh, a simple example here, uh, trivial, I create an implicit class, uh, int op, so I'm going to put all my extension methods to integers here. I define one that it's star, we'll just print you know, a number of stars. So if I call five stars, I get a string with five stars. Very simple. Value classes. This one it's a lot more interesting. So value classes are used to avoid object allocation. Conditions applies. It's not always. Uh, you can check the documentation to see where y you cannot avoid object allocation. Uh, they bring you the type safety of custom data types without the runtime overhead. So this is really awesome. So let's say this is good for you instead of declaring using primitive types, and by primitive here I do not mean JVM primitives, but you know, base types like integer boolean of course, but also strings and dates. Uh, instead of using those types, those bare types, you can define types like Celsius and Fahrenheit for temperature instead of double, you know, weight and height instead of double again. Uh, first name, email instead of string, age instead of int. Okay, so you, you, you can define a type, but you, you do not pay for that type, you know. Uh, at runtime, they will, they will be converted to integer and strings, but at compile time, you cannot mix them. So it gives you additional type safety. Uh, so you can only have a primary constructor with exactly one vol parameter. You can only have methods, you know, in your value class. You cannot have anything else. Uh, you may not define equals or hash code, and it cannot be extended by another class. So here an example, uh, you can use case class. Mm. So I have a case class h uh, that encapsulates an integer, and the way you, you, you say that it's a value class, you add extends and vol, and now I have vol h equals h18. Uh, at compile time, age is of type age, but at runtime is of type int. So if I try in my code to do something like age plus one, it's gonna give me a type mismatch, okay? It's going to protect me that I, I do a stupid thing with, with my types. Extension methods. So extension methods, it's when you combine both value class and implicit class. So you get allocation-free extension methods. So this is equivalent to using an object with the static help methods. Uh, it's just a simple mechanical transformation performed by the compiler. There is no magic here. So an example, I, I defined an implicit class before, uh, and this is equivalent, when I call 5.star, this is equivalent to uh, creating a new instance of my int ops class, and then calling the method star on that instance. So this is what we had before. With extension methods, what I get when I call 5.stars is like I had an object with methods that take an integer as parameter, and then I'm calling a static method on that object passing the parameter. It doesn't get much faster than that on the JVM. You know, you, you, it's a static call, you invoke static. It's just as fast as it gets. So it's a lot more efficient. You do not have an object allocation just to call a method on that object and then throw the object away. It doesn't need to be garbage collected. So it's a lot more efficient. String interpolation. String interpolation was introduced in Scala 2.10. It's also a very awesome feature. Uh, so I just prepend an, an S to my string and then I can use the dollar sign to interpolate values there. Uh, and it supports an expression, doesn't need to be just um, variables. I can do computations there as well. And worked with triple quotes. And it's really a shame that you do not have syntax highlighting there. 
but <laughs> you know you, you can create a, as a long as a block of code a text you want and interpolate as many strings as you want now you come to me and say oh good fine cool but you know i've been using ruby and python and they have this for AIDS. What's the big deal about it? Well, the nice thing is that in Scala, we do have a few features on string interpolation that I have never seen in any other language, especially the dynamic ones. Oh, sorry, I missed one. So if you need to escape the dollar sign, you just use a double dollar sign. Yes, so here, I have the first two dollar signs is to produce a literal dollar sign, and then I'm interpolating the A. That's why I have three dollar signs. Okay, so those are the features that we have in Scala that no other dynamic language is going to give to you. So formatted strings. So I can just pass some uh, formatting string instead of using the S interpolator. I'm going to use the F for formatting, and it will format my my strings um, for me. And this is the really cool thing. The F interpolator is type safe, okay? Uh, not even C or Java have that. So if, if I call matpy $d, uh, I'm gonna get a type mismatch because the per percent D is for integers and I'm giving it a double. So this happens at compile time. You know, you have type safe strings. Uh, this is awesome. <laughs> Um, and of course, you, you can create your own interpolators. You, you do not need to be limited to the interpolators that the language provides to you. Uh, so there are just about 250 frameworks and libraries for Scala that give you a, a SQL interpolator for, um, of course, for, for, for SQL queries. And how does a SQL interpolator is different from, say, the, the, the regular string interpolator? The difference is that we'll escape you know, when, when you interpolate a variable, that variable will be escaped, so you prevent SQL injection. Uh, JSON interpolator, if there is 250 for SQL, there should be about 500 for, for JSON. And again, so what's the difference from the regular interpolator? Is that it may recursively serialize uh, your interpolation. So let's say that 4 is, is an array. It will not call array to a string. It will not put some garbage there. It will recursively convert the full array to a, into a JSON representation and interpolate that JSON representation there. So it's a very powerful mechanism that you have at your disposal, very flexible. I, I don't know of any other language that do the same, uh, the same level that Scala is doing. Features and promise. Uh, those were introduced in 2.10 and they then were backported to 2.9.3. Also, they come from Twitter. Uh, future is a way to perform many operations in parallel in an efficient and non-blocking asynchronous way. Future is a placeholder for a result that does not yet exist, but which may become available at some point. It has a lot of callbacks like incomplete and success on failure that will be executed eventually. Okay, this is important to know. The order in which the callbacks are executed is not determinist. Uh, and callback may, may not be called sequentially, but execute concurrently, you know, at, at the same time. And they will not necessarily happen after the, the future completes. They will be eventually. You don't know when. Uh, and future, again, just like tries, futures are no associative, so they are, strictly speaking, not monads, but they do behave like monads. They, Follow them on at the interface, they can be used in for comprehension and they can be combined using a lot of utility methods. Um, so I'm gonna give you an example here. Uh, I have something very simple. I'm gonna take a string and uh, a time interval. Then I'm gonna print a string just to say that I get started. Then my thread gets to sleep and it wakes up again, okay? And returns the, 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 the tag. And here, it's how you may see some code using features combined, the features, you know, in a for comprehension. I fire one feature, two features, three features, and then I group together the results. But there's a problem here. I see some faces, <laughs> uh, some ugly faces here. So yeah, I know there's a problem here, is that if you do that, the features are going to be executed in parallel because I'm using here, you know, a for comprehension. So I'm calling feature A flat map feature 
feature B, map, feature C. So feature B doesn't get started till after feature A completes, and the same for C. So this is not the best way for you to combine features. So the way you, have, you should combine features is you start them uh, outside the full comprehension, so they get started now in parallel, they get executed in parallel, and then you combine the results in a full comprehension. So when I do that, um, if you run this two, three, four, five times, you're going to get two, three, four, five different results because this is non-determinist. One run that I did, uh, it started A, C, and B, so you can see that C started before B. This is real, you know, I didn't make the, that. And C ended before B, which ended before A, so it, it doesn't happen in any predictable order. Uh, while on the first example, you can run it a thousand times, a thousand times you're going to get always the same result. Um, so promises, uh, future is a read-only place holder for a result which does not uh, yet exist. A promise is a writable single assignment container which completes a feature. So one, it's, it's the reciprocal of the other. You use a promise to fulfill a future. Um, here is an example how you, 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 you could use it. You create a promise. And then from that promise, you, you get a future. And we can assert that the future is not completed. And then I do some computation in parallel. And then I fulfill the promise. Uh, I call the success method there. And now my future is completed. Usually, you're not going to need to worry about promise so much um, unless you're writing some kind of framework or library code. Usually, you're going to use just the futures, not the promises. Um, one very useful method is future sequence, which converts a sequence of futures to a future sequence. So it's going to be very common for you when you're doing some real-world computations that you're going to end up with a sequence of futures, and that's not what you want. You want a future sequence. Just call this method for you. It does the conversion for you. Dynamic trait introduced in Scala 2.10 is just syntax sugar. You know, It's a simple mechanical transformation performed by the compiler. There's no magic here. It's not any sort of dynamic type. So I've seen people say that Scala now has dynamic type, that Scala has optional task type. No, 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 no. Nothing like that. It's just syntax sugar. Okay? And this, the main use case is to enable flexible DSLs, you know, especially when you want to interface with dynamic language and, and data formats like JSON. Uh, what you have is you extend the dynamic trait, and you implement at least one of the following methods. Apply dynamic, apply dynamic, name it, select dynamic, and update dynamic. And then the compiler will perform the following transformations. So if I have foo.bar in my code and, and my class foo does not have a bar, uh, the compiler will change that to foo.selectDynamic bar. So now your select dynamic method can handle that uh, as you want. And similarly for, for everything else, so you see that you can have uh, like access syntax, foo.bar, you can have assignment syntax, foo.bar equals something. Uh, you can have an array syntax, you know, foo.bar zero, so I'm accessing the, the zeroth element of that array, and I can make assignment to that as well. Uh, I can have things that look like their method calls, so you, you, you have a very flexible interface here that you can use. And this, again, this is most useful for, for, for DSLs. ACA actor. So in 2.10, uh, the default Scala actor library was duplicated. Uh, now you should use ACA. Uh, it's, there's too much stuff that I cannot cover here. I'm going to refer you to the documentation if you want to know the details for the migration. Modularization. So now some of the more advanced language features have to be explicitly enabled. So, and the way you do that, you just import language.x, where x is one of those options, dynamic, existential, higher kinds, implicit conversions, postfix operations, reflexive calls, and macros. Uh, you can also enable then uh, on the when you call the compiler, uh, of course, you can add that to your SBT, build SBT file. And you can pass a uh, wildcard, so you, you enable everything. And one thing that I want to, to, to call attention here, the implicit conversion, it's only needed when you're defining new implicit conversions. It's not needed to use uh, implicit conversion that it's already defined. 
and it's not needed to define implicit classes. Okay? So I showed you how to use implicit class. You do not need to import implicit conversions for that. Reflection, macros, and quasicode. So this in 2.10, it's still flagged as experimental. And what is meant by experimental here is that the interface may change from one release to another without duplicating it first. You know, so your code, if you're using that, your code may break without warning. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's not stable yet. So with macros, Scala can finally throw runtime errors at compile time. Okay. Uh, so this is used for, for metaprogramming, programs that modify themselves at compile time. Uh, very useful for, for code generation and for advanced DSLs. Uh, you, you have uh, reflection uh, can happen both at compile time when they're called macros and also at runtime. And the reason why we need special runtime support that we cannot just use the Java facilities is that there are many Scala specific elements that are just not available under the Scala, under the Java reflection API. Um, and this gives us reified Scala expressions. So very, very useful as we know from the JVM. Quasi codes are significantly simplified notation to manipulate Scala syntax trees with easy. Quasi codes are awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, so what it is, uh, I have a string interpolator. Look at the power of string interpolators here again. Uh, and I call it on an expression foo plus bar. And now I, what it does, it parses that foo plus bar as a Scala code and builds an abstract syntax tree for me for that code. So I can do something like, I can assert that foo plus bar has the same structure, has an equal structure as the AST for foo dot plus bar. So you just see that it doesn't matter which syntax you use, you're going to get the same uh, syntax tree here. Okay, now how it gets really, really cool is that they can be used to, to decompose via pattern matching. So if I do something like uh, dollar foo plus dollar bar, and uh, I declare variable, you know, using pattern matching to, to decompose an expression like one plus two times three, what I get now is that I actually have created two variables here, one variable called foo and one variable called bar. And the variable foo has uh, abstract syntax tree that it's equal to, to the one, it's just a single two, no, not very important. But bar, look at bar, bar, it, it doesn't match token by token. This is what I want to show here. So foo match one plus match plus, but bar match two times three. So I can see that bar has the same structure as two times three. And again, just to show that it's not a matter of how you write it, I can call it, use any syntax I want, any representation I want, they, they give me the same structure. So this is really powerful, so that you can decompose Scala expressions and assign different parts of your syntax tree to different variables. Uh, I'm gonna give an example of how you can use this in, in practice. Let's say that you have a logger, you know, you want to use a logger, and we know that best practice says that we should first test if the logger is enabled before we make the logger call. So we would have something like that. Um, but this is too verbose and repeti repetitive. What I want is something like log, we, we, we have a problem. I just wanted to, to, to have a, a simple expression. So how can you, we use macros to produce that? So the first thing I do, I define my method log, and it's going to take a string as parameter. It's going to return unit in this particular case. And I say that that is a macro, OK? And log impl is the name of the macro that's going to implement that macro. So here's my log impl um, method. It takes a context and a few things here. But the important thing is the string interpolator. So what I do is I just write my Scala code and put my variables that need to be interpolated there is just like writing HTML templates, you know, in any web framework. You're writing Scala code as easily as, you're generating Scala code as easily as if you were writing an HTML template. That's really awesome and very powerful and very easy to use to, to generate Scala code. Uh, time is running out, so 
very quickly here some examples where they use macros. It's the play JSON API use macros for, for JSON serialization and deserialization. It's type safe, there's no runtime reflection and no bytecode enhancement. Everything happens at compile time. And Scala Pickling, it's a different uh, serialization framework, very similar. Um, case class with more than 22 parameters. So you should not have to need a case class with more than 22 parameters, but if you do need it, you know, your day has come. Scala 2.11 does support case class with more parameters than it's reasonable to think about. And I could not really imagine and, and use it for example to put here, so. <laughs> New method in collections. So this is by any means an, an exhaustive list, uh, but we have things like span and iterate, or we have a lot of new uh, methods in, in the option class. If you're gonna stay for my next talk in five minutes, I'm gonna talk about that. Uh, sequence permutations, sequence-like combinations. You, you have no idea how m those two methods saved me at many job interviews, you know? <laughs> so it's very useful for a job interview when people ask you to write permutations and combinations of, of lists. Now it's quite easy. Uh, okay, uh, SBT incremental compilation. This was introduced in Scala 2.11. Okay, so now Scala compiles 10 times faster. But do not expect their build times to change because you know they are using the, the, the <laughs> saved cycles to mine byte, bitcoins. <laughs> so you, you need to have SBT 0.13.2 and you add this single line to, to your build that SBT. I did that for some projects, okay, so this, those numbers are real. I saw uh, recompilation, not, not compilation, this is wrong, sorry. Recompilation, so when you made a change to your code base and you have to recompile uh, some files, there were speed improvements from 25 to 80%. Now, the really good thing is that the bigger the project, the better the improvement. The 80% came from the biggest project. So where it matters the, the most, so, so it, it's not, Insignificant, you know, 80%, it's a lot. Uh, of course, your mileage may vary. Uh, Pre-def, triple um, question mark. This is a placeholder for methods that have not yet been implemented. It's very useful for if you're doing test-driven development for code samples in presentations, blogs. You know, if you need to implement an abstract method in a rush, so let's say you need to implement a class and an interface, a, a trait, and it has a lot of abstract methods and you don't care about those methods at that time, you just put triple question marks and you're good to go. You, do, you can have revisit it later. So you just do that and of course if you try, try to call, it's gonna throw an exception. It, 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 it sounds silly, but actually it's more useful than, than you think, you know? I've used it a couple of times. Um, Rappel colors, and so since Scala 2.11.4, now the, the, the Rappel use colors. Uh, you just pass this flag, and you can see some colors in your Rappel. It's not full syntax highlighting, but it's cool. You know, it helps. Uh, Scala 2.12 and beyond. So what's in Scala future? The, if I, I see some Scala days, uh, T-shirts over here. So if you went to, to Scala Day San Francisco, Martin Odarts gave a really good talk, a keynote about the new features in, in Scala 2.12, some of the things they're planning to do. They have a lot of change to, to, to the language to simplify, to unify uh, concepts and to change the, the type system. Uh, one of the things that in 2.12, they're gonna have full support for Java 8. They're going to use method handlers and the lambdas, uh, so Scala, Scala closures are, are going to compile to Java Lambda so you can interrupt back and forth, okay? So Java 8 style closures and Lambda using method handles. Uh, it's also going to support Java streams and functional interface. Uh, the Sambdas that we have in, in, in Java 8 now, you can implement those in Scala and interface trait. And it's bidirectional, so you can both from Java call Scala and from Scala call Java, which means that Scala 2.12 is gonna be Java 8 only, which is not a bad thing because Java 7 is end of line already, so you should be using Java 8 anyway. Um, SIP20 improved lazy vol initialization, so lazy vol are the saucers of Scala, you know, they look delicious until you learn how they're made. 
So if, if you, you don't know, lace vaults, they are not as you know, perfect as they, they seem. There, there, there are a lot of uh, little details that you should worry, uh, performance details, and also lace vaults can deadlock. Even if one lace vault does not refer to another lace vault and vice versa, even if you do not have a circular dependency, they still can deadlock. Uh, so they, 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 do not, they are not as funny as they look. So they have some things in the pipeline to improve that. Uh, SPORE, uh, it's some improvements for foreclosures for concurrent and distributed environment. Uh, async and await, so those are macros that make using futures even simpler. So you do not need to use four comprehensions like I did before. You can write your code using futures almost like it, it were a sequential uh, computation. So you, you, your code doesn't look any different. You do not have the callback hell that People say that you have to be passing features, features. So you can write your code that looks like sequential code, but it's using features, and a macro does all the, the nice work for you. Uh, some simplification and cleanup in the collection library. Scala meta, more, even more advanced features for, for reflection uh, and macros. We're going to have a code styler checker that, that uses the compiler, so very useful. Uh, you can enable some warnings there. Uh, and of course, some deprecations, procedure syntax. So you cannot leave the equal sign behind anymore. So now the equal sign is required uh, when you create a method. XML literals, they will be gone. You're going to have to use a string interpolations for XML literals now. Um, and some less used package, they you see the end of the day. Scala.js, uh, it's Scala ported to, to JavaScript, a very awesome project. I recommend you have a look. And of course, we have some Scala compiler forks now, you know, uh, from there's the Dotty language, which is a project Martin Odersk is working on to simplify Scala. Maybe that will be Scala 3.0 someday. Uh, type level fork the Scala compiler, Paul Phillips fork the Scala compiler, which led, you know, uh, Oppenheimer to say that the Nobel Prize in physics this year should go to the physicist that does not fork the Scala compiler. Okay, just too many for forks happening. Uh, those are the references. Uh, you can see the slides on, on my GitHub. There are many articles uh, in our blogs about some of the stuff here. All the release notes and all the documentation that you, you need. So if you have the slides, there are clickable links. Um, and that's it. Thank you, everyone. I'm sorry we were late. <laughs> I don't think we have time for questions.